So let's get started, bro. And then there, right. as people jump on, that uh, they'll be able to to do it. That way we respect everybody's time on here. So let's mm -hmm. get started, guys. 100%. So listen, welcome. I'm aware that you could be spending some of your non-refundable precious breaths doing anything else with anybody else. And me and Jose sincerely appreciate you spending some time with us. And we want to keep coming to you guys with really relevant, tangible, like tactical information. Because what I'm aware of is that the seasons are changing. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are seasons. If you don't live in a place where there's seasons, um, you know, I live in Florida, so when it gets 60 degrees here, we all wear parkas and put beanies on. But in places where there's real seasons, you can tell there are some indicators that, that, that let you know that the seasons are changing. One would be temperature. Another one would be foliage, right? And there's economic seasons as well. And, you know, we're beginning to see that that economic season is changing and we're definitely going into winter. And a lot of people haven't experienced the winter before, right? So we want to make sure that agents, the community, whether you're riding with us or you're, uh, you know, with somebody else at the moment, irregardless, we want to make sure that we're coming to you with real tactical, real practical information that you can actually utilize and implement that'll help you to help your clients accomplish their goals and objectives. So, you know, I'll, I'll bring you back to like a, a time in my career in like 2007, I had moved, right? My mom had a health event that caused everybody's undivided attention. So I shut down my business and moved to South Florida to a new market, right? And started over from scratch. Now, prior to that, I had spent a lot of time and energy and effort learning how to list property in high volume, right? I understood this mechanism of PLAN, prospect, lead, follow up, go on appointments, negotiate deals. Like I, I got that. So when I moved to a new marketplace, I hit the ground running and I took 10 listings in, I don't know, maybe like a month or two. And then none of them sold. And it was interesting because I remember being on a run really frustrated, right? I'm running, getting out this frustration, right? And I was like racking my brain, like, I don't understand what's missing here. Like I'm, I'm prospecting, I'm handling objections, I'm getting listing agreements authorized and nothing's moving. And then I got this like blinding flash of the obvious. And the blinding flash of the obvious was I didn't know how to price them properly. Because what was happening simultaneously, keep in mind when this was taking place, which was 2007, is the marketplace was starting to radically downshift right? Inventory was going up, demand was shrinking. So prices were moving very quickly and they were moving in a downward fashion with downward pressure. So once I recognized that, I said, oh, wow, like I really have to understand not only market dynamics where I started to preview properties prior to listing appointments, right? I would go to three previews prior to physically going inside so I could physically lay eyes on the property. So that way, when I say something like, yep, I've been inside this home and I don't know, like, have you been inside it? And they're like, nope. Yep. Well, I can tell you with you know certainty that it's actually a little bit nicer than yours. Can I share why? And then we could go over that information. But that was for me to gather data so I can understand market dynamics. I also started to look very, very closely at market statistics, inventory climbing, demand softening, how many expireds, right? How many properties being withdrawn, things of that nature. So again, I can get a clear, accurate assessment of what's happening in the marketplace, I started to look at macroeconomic trends so I could understand what's taking place so I could guide people accordingly. And then I started to delve in and study at a super high level the process. Because what I'm aware of is a lot of you guys imagine that a price reduction, that it happens when you pick up the phone to actually ask for it. And what I can tell you with 100% certainty, and this is one of the things that, you know, I shared with Jose as he was coming up, is that that's actually not where it starts. It actually starts at the listing presentation, right? And it's the way that I'm setting things up. It's the way I'm managing expectations, right? And we need to know and understand that this particular skill is going to be one that's going to be required for the next 12 to 18 months at a minimum. Reason being is what's causing that slowdown. So imagine there's a train that's going 100 miles an hour and it's chugging down the tracks and it's whistling and it's hissing and then somebody slams the brakes. 
Well, the breaks is going from 3% to 7.2%, which is what we are at now. We just had another high inflation reading, which means that we're going to have another Fed funds rate hike in November, which means that mortgage rates will go to 8% by the end of the year, maybe a little higher. So this conversation and understanding the process, which begins at the listing presentation and culminates with you actually asking for an adjustment is something that you need to learn because when times get tough, only the skilled get paid. If you're taking notes, write that down. When times get tough, only the skilled get paid. So as far as it beginning at the listing presentation, it begins with once you've settled on something that seems to be reasonable, right? You're going to say something like, well, um, what I'm aware of is the marketplace seems to be showing us somewhere around 550 seems to be reasonable. And we're going to know together as a team, if the marketplace agrees with us in terms of price and product, do you know how they'll let us know that? And then you're quiet. And then they're going to say something like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll get an offer or showing. That's exactly right. We'll get showings and we'll get an offer on the table. Now, if for some reason the buying public does not see enough value, they're going to tell us that as well. How do you think they'll tell us that? And they'll say, well, I guess we won't get an offer. It's exactly right. We'll get showings and no offers or we'll get very few showings, if any at all. So we are going to know together as a team if the marketplace agrees with us. And we'll know that very quickly within 10, maybe 14 days tops. And if they do agree, as you mentioned, we'll get showings and no, we'll get showings and offers, and that's great. If for some reason they don't see enough value, we'll get showings and no offers or very few showings, if any at all. And if that happens, we can always make a small appropriate adjustment in terms of the price. Does that approach make sense to you? So at the listing presentation, we're beginning the conversation, we're planting the seed for a conversation that more likely than not, we're gonna have to have. Does that make sense? So, and Jose, if you would, like prior to us having that conversation about it beginning there, what was happening for you? Like, how was that tripping you up? What I thought is, uh, I actually felt that it was something that I was doing. Like, I actually felt that like, maybe I wasn't marketing the property right. Maybe I wasn't attracting the right person. Maybe that there was something I can do. But then it, whenever you started going over the system with me, I realized that usually when a property is not selling, it's either price, uh, 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 price, condition, or in some cases, even marketing. So when I broke it down to the three things, it made things a lot simpler. What I did want to ask you just for our viewers is whenever, I, and this is important because when you broke it down to me, I broke it down in different sections and that conversation I labeled it as the talk and setting expectations at the listing presentation, almost like here's what's going to happen next. My question to you is, do you do that before or after you get the contract signed? Yeah, it's a good question. So I do that. Um, let's say we've had the conversation. We agree on where we're going to get started off at price wise prior to actually authorizing the listing paperwork. Once we've agreed on price. I have that conversation with them. So we're going to know together as a team if the marketplace sees value. Sometimes it's simultaneous. You yeah. know, like as it's kind of taking place, but I will not leave until we've had that conversation. Like we're going to talk about it and we're going to talk about it in a very upfront, straightforward manner because I need to manage that expectation and they need to, I need to plant that seed and then continue to keep coming yeah. back to it, which we'll talk about as time progresses in terms of the honeymoon period. So this is a conversation that I have with clients, like, and I call it the talk, and it's very similar to what you're saying. I actually do it after I get the contract signed, and I say, look, Aaron, this is what's going to happen next. And it's basically me setting expectations and me letting the client know, like, hey, look, this is what you can expect. This is what's going to happen next. So my assistant, her name is Lucy. She's going to give you a call tomorrow. She's going to send you a copy of all of the paperwork. She's also going to install the lockbox on the property. She's going to install the super box and she's going to coordinate the cleaning lady and the gardener for, for them to come out here. Then what's going to happen is the day that the property comes on the marketplace, let's say it's next week, I'm going to give you a quick call and I'm going to say, congratulations, the property is listed and listed for sale. Then from that point forward, I'm going to be communicating with you every seven to 10 days. I usually say every Wednesday, because that's when I do my updates. I know that you do it every seven to 10 days. I'm going to be communicating with you every Wednesday, and I'm going to be giving you an update as to what 
kind of activity and what kind of feedback we're getting back from the marketplace. And then at that point, I could have like a very similar talk to what you said. Here's what's going to happen. The marketplace is actually going to give us feedback, blah, 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 blah. But that's kind of like the way that I set up that conversation. And it's right after I um, get the contract signed and right after I do my new listing intake form, which is a form that I fill out whenever we take a listing, um, just so that I can hand it off to my admin correctly. Then I have the talk. Now they know what to expect moving forward over the next week or two as we get the property ready for sale. And they know when to expect my next conversation as well, too. So they're not Correct. wondering like, hey, look, why, why Jose used to call me every day. Why hasn't he called me in the last week? No, no, no. Here's the way it's going to work. Here's uh, me setting proper expectations with them. That's right. And, and then the I reason- also let them know. I also let them know, hey, look, and if you need to get a hold of me, the only time I don't answer my cell phone is when I'm in an appointment. You have my direct cell phone number. I'm always available. Blah, blah, blah. That's awesome. And yeah. And then what came up for me is the only reason I don't, I used to give like a particular time that I'm going to like follow up with them. If you'll, what'll happen is, is as the marketplace begins to shift and change, you're going to start carrying larger amounts of inventory. Big time. So we've had to get like, it was kind of weird over the last two years, I'm carrying like three listings and I was like, mm-hmm. but you'd have like 20 pendings. Well, now that's going to switch. You'll have 15 or 20 listings. So if I'm saying to somebody like, Hey, I'm going to follow up with you on Wednesdays. It's like, wow, now I'm locking myself in. So I remember okay. back in the day um, that started to happen. So what I would say, to, that's why I change it to every seven to 10 days or maybe every 10 to 14 days. So it's giving myself room Time. because what I'm aware of is they will, hey, you didn't call me on Wednesday. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like they'll start to follow, like uh, give you static about it. So that. that would be the next level for me, basically. Right? Exactly. That would yep. be for me to grow from 70 to 80 deals to 100 plus. You know, that yep. would be one of the changes that I would have to make. Yes. So, and so we begin to manage that expectation at the listing appointment. Now I'm noticing some questions in the chat from Mary and Ricardo, and they're, they're along the same lines, which is that I want you guys to understand that if people aren't motivated, this, what we're saying to you is not going to make too much of a difference, right? Because motivation fixes price. And if their only motivation is a particular price, then no matter what you do or what you say, there's going to be crazy resistance and they're probably not going to make the adjustment. So that's why you need to get really good at pre-qualification and be looking for life events, death, divorce, job relocation, moving to assisted living facilities, had a baby, um, you know, downsizing, retiring. Like there has to be a compelling reason. Otherwise, they're not going to be willing to do what's necessary in order to get the job done. So we're operating under the assumption, guys, that we've already had those conversations. We pre-qualified. We know that it's not an option to not sell. We know it's an option, not an option to rent. So this is how you can um, kind of move uh, procedurally towards the adjustment. So it begins with the um, listing presentation and I manage the expectation. The second is, is you need to have a honeymoon period. So what I mean by that is we have to go back to service and listings guys. Like we have not had to do that in probably 24 months. You could put something on the market, never talk to them. It would sell and it didn't matter. Where now, if you're taking notes, write this down. You have to earn the right to ask for an adjustment. You got to earn the right. So what does that mean? When they first list the property with you, they'll let you watch their kids for the weekend, right? There's this ether. Oh, Jose, he's the man. Oh, Aaron, he's so cool. Like, la, la, la. Oh, that's great. One adjustment, they start to like you less. Two adjustments, even less. Three, they hate your guts. Okay, so we have like 90 days, really, in terms of those adjustments um, to to get to a place where the marketplace may respond and we get it sold. So we need to create a honeymoon period with massive levels of communication up front. So one is when we get the agreement authorized, they get a copy like immediately in the mail. If you're doing bomb bomb videos, send a bomb bomb video. You or your staff. Hey there. You know, uh, it's Aaron here. Congratulations on getting one step closer, getting your home on the market, getting it sold. Again, we're super appreciative of the opportunity to be of assistance. Here's what you can expect next steps. We call the photographer, blah, 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 right? So it's communication. Then once you get the pictures, you send them a copy so they can review, cool. When it goes active, either you or somebody on your team picks up the phone and calls them. Hey, Jose, it's Aaron here. Just want to give you a quick update, let you know what's going on. You got a moment? Yep. Pictures came back. They look fantastic. I know our team, we sent them over to you for review. We're getting everything in place. We should be up and active on the market here within the next 24 to 48 hours. And as we discussed, we're going to know as a team if the marketplace sees value in terms of price and product. 
If they are, we're going to get tons of showings. We'll get offers on the table. If for some reason they don't see enough value, we'll get showings and no offers or very few showings, if any at all. And as promised, I'll be giving you an update every seven or 10 days, letting you know what's going on. And if we need to make any adjustments, what they are. Make sense? Yep. You got any questions for me? No. Again, appreciate your business. Look forward to talking to you soon. But you see what we did there? So massive levels of communication up front. And then what's also happening during this honeymoon period, I'm continuing to manage the expectation. So we talked about it once at the listing floor. Now I brought it up before it's even on the market. Then when we're on the market, seven to 10 days, we're calling them again. Hey, Jose, it's Aaron here. Just want to give you a quick update. Let you know what's going on. You got a moment? Yep. We've been on a marketplace, looks like for 10 days. And in that time frame, we've had three showings, which is great. Because what that means is what we're doing is working. It's driving traffic into the property, right? Networking with the top agents in town. And we're pleased with that. At the same time, we are going to know together as a team, if the marketplace sees value in terms of price and product, if they do, we're going to get lots of showings and offers. If for some reason they don't, we'll get very few showings, if any at all. Now, the good news is, Jose, we are not in that last category, right out of the gate. We get showings. So we will know in another maybe 10 or so days, 12, maybe 14 tops, if they see enough value to make us an offer, if they do great. If not, we could put our heads together and perhaps adjust the approach in some way. Does that make sense? Yep, makes sense. Okay, great. Appreciate your time. Look forward to speaking to you soon. So now we've had that conversation three times and we've only been on the market for seven to 10 days. Versus what most agents will do is they will realize that it's not going to sell in the first seven days because they're not getting too much activity. They're hitting crickets. Then internally, because they're afraid of conflict, they will avoid speaking to the seller. And then when it's time to ask them for an adjustment, there's lots of internal tension because they haven't earned the right. right. And I'm aware, Jose, like I remember when we first had that conversation, and I was teaching that to you, you're like, bro, earning the right. That is so strong. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it uh, it uh, for me, like I wanted to take the listing and just basically have it sell. And what I didn't realize is that this is actually a skill that uh, that you've got to practice. So what was happening for me is that as I was leading up to those types of conversations, because I wasn't having them up front, it was leading to a lot of internal tension, bro. Like a lot of it, like almost to the point where I did not want to have that conversation. But what I realized is that as soon as I understood the process as to how to do it, it reduced that internal tension. And then also like when we actually asked for the price reductions, had to have that conversation that made it a lot uh, easier for me as well to, to, to kind of have that type of conversation. The other thing that I realized as well too, whenever I was asking for price adjustments, I would see some agents ask for like five or $10,000. I think that that's relative to whatever price you're at. You know, if it's a hundred thousand dollar home, five to 10,000 is five to 10%. You know, if it's a million dollar property and you reduce it five or 10,000, it's not really very much because it's like less than 1%, you know? So. Yeah. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And I'm also aware too, that I, I remember distinctly that you were taking it personal. Like you felt you did something wrong. Yeah. And do you remember I shared with you, I was like, Hey bro, like, did you do that? Or did the marketplace do that? And you were like, uh, well, I guess the market. I'm like, yeah. So if they want to get mad at somebody, tell them to like open up the door and yell at the neighbors. Like they're the ones who've agreed to prices. Like you didn't do that. And I'm aware that you taking it personal was actually creating a lot of friction for you where you would oh, go back time. and ask, yeah. right? I, I would not want to call them asking them for a price reduction basically. Yeah. And, and what I'm aware of is that that unwillingness to, to call them and ask to me is malpractice, right? Because they've entrusted you with, um, you know, protecting the value of their property. And I want everybody on this call to really hear me, okay? Adam, Alejandro, Alexander, Amanda, Andres, Angie, Bonnie, Bill, Ke uh, Calvin, Camila. I want everybody to really hear me, okay? Is that it is your duty and responsibility to tell them the truth. If you don't, in a marketplace that's going backwards, you will cost them a lot of money, period. I do believe that over the next 12 months, we will see prices come down anywhere from 10 to 20%. So understanding this process and helping somebody to guide through it quickly and see what they need to do so they can make that decision fast, it's going to save them a lot of money. 
The, the other thing, Aaron, is, and this kind of goes back to like the over-delivering part or over-communication. Over-delivering and over-communication doesn't always mean like like calling them every single time. It's just like having like a different level of touch. So w- what we implemented at our company is different ways for even my admin to touch them. That way they, that way we're providing that high level of customer service. So some of the things that we do is the the moment I go back to the office and the moment that my assistant sends them a copy of the contract, she basically in calls to introduce herself to, to them. She coordinates the photos. Once we get the photos back, before we even put her on the market, we send them uh, the photos immediately. Like, hey, look, just wanted to give you a heads up. Like, we just sent you a copy of all the pictures. Um we're not going to be posting all of the pictures. We're only going to be selecting the best 10 to 20. Uh, we're also going to be doing some additional editing. We'll send you the final edited pictures once we receive them. But those are like additional touches that you're doing to be able to provide the high, a higher level of customer service. Because here's the reality, guys. If the customer feels like you're not representing them the right way or you're not communicating with them enough, it's going to make it harder for you to get a price reduction because you're going to hear a lot more things like, well, what are you doing to market my home? Like, I haven't heard from you in two weeks. Like what's going on there. So like, ha- like I can't stress the importance of having systems procedures to have different touches. Um, so that whenever you do ask for something like that, it's, it's, uh, it, it's easier for you to get that, um, as opposed to not having those separate touches. So there's different touches that you can make at different points um, to ensure that the moment it comes on the marketplace, we automatically send them a, a copy of their listing. We send, we say, Hey, look, just want to let you know the property just went live for your convenience. We've sent you a copy of the listing. If you have any changes, please, uh, let us know. And we'll make those immediately, yeah. you know? Yep. And I love that, man. And so what you're noticing, like a common theme of what me and Jose are saying to you is that number one, this is a skill that you're going to need for the next 12 to 24 months, period, end of story. It's just the way it is. And it's based on this kind of economic slowdown due to the cost of money going up and it's not going to stop anytime soon, right? So I can either suck my thumb or I can actually learn the skill and do something about it. Do right? that again, the sucking the thumb? <laughs> or I can do something about it, right? Right. And I can learn this skill, okay? Um, The second is, is that you're gonna have to really service listings at a much higher level, like a honeymoon period, right? So lots of communication up front, and and as I'm updating them, reminding them, as we discussed, we're gonna know together as a team if the marketplace sees value. If they do, you know, we get showings and no offers, or very few showing, I mean, if they do, we'll get lots of showings, we'll get offers on the table. If for some reason they don't see enough value, we'll get showings and no offers, or very few showings, if any at all. I, the good news is we're not in that last category already. We've had a few showings. You know, at the same time, I'll be giving you updates as promised every 10 or so days, 10, 12, 14 days. Uh, and, you know, if we need to make any adjustments, we'll let you know what they are. Fair enough. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good. Appreciate your time. Talk to you soon. Ooh. So now let's say it's time to have the, the actual conversation about the reduction. So um, let's go ahead and do that, Jose. So let's say I call you up and I'm like, hey, Jose, it's Aaron Novello, your real estate agent. How are you? Uh, Doing good, Aaron. You got an offer yet? Hey, man, I appreciate you asking. And I'm glad that you're equally as motivated and focused on getting an offer on the property as I am. And that's precisely why I'm calling you. Do you got a moment for me? Yeah, I do. All right. Awesome. So the good news is, is we've been on the market now, looks like for 18 full days. And in that time frame, we've actually had seven showings. Did you know that? Sounds about right. For some reason, I thought it was more like seven. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, if you count the one today, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, and that's great because what that means is that what we're doing is working. We're driving traffic into the property, networking, you know, with the top agents, marketing on your behalf. At the same time, Jose, having that number of showings and no offers, it's actually concerning me. May I share with you why? Yeah. Well, the marketplace is telling us very clearly that they see enough value to look, they're just not seeing enough value to buy. Now, when we originally connected, you shared with me that the main reason that you wanted to sell this home is that you and your family were looking to move to Texas. Now, is that still the case or has that changed? No, that's still the the same. All right, awesome. And my job is to help you. It's never to talk you into doing anything. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm clear. Is it an option for you to not sell the home and still make this move to Texas? 
I could do it. I really don't want to though. Like, I mean, I could sit around and rent it. I just, uh, not the ideal situation because it won't allow me to purchase something else out there. I understand. But and, at the same time, I don't want to give it away, you know? Yep. And I don't want you to either. Right. And again, whatever you decide, I'm going to support you hundred percent. So let me ask you this. Let's say that we knew that if we made a decision to rent it, that through no fault of your own or mine, you'd have to hold it for a long time, like to be a long distance landlord, maybe like three, four years before you could sell it at a price you feel more comfortable with. Is that something you would remotely be interested in? Or would you say, no, like, I don't want to do that. I just want to cash out and be done. How long did you say? Did you say? Like three to four years. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't. Like, I mean, if it was like six months or even like till next year, I would, but not that uh, now three to five years at all, for sure. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So it sounds like then what you've decided that what makes the most sense for you and your family is to actually get the home sold. So with that being the case, we have a couple of options that are at our disposal and I'd like to go over them with you. So that way you can decide what you feel is best and whatever you decide, I'll support you hundred percent. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. So the first option is, is that we leave the price the same, right? And we see what happens. Now, more likely than not, Jose, again, no, through no fault of yours or mine, just because of market dynamics shifting and changing and interest rates going up very quickly and where the economy is, we'll probably get the same result, which is some showings and no offers on the table. And that's not me being negative. It's just an accurate assessment of reality. Now, the second option is, is that we make an adjustment in terms of the price, which the marketplace is clearly showing us based on showings and a lack of offers. And in doing so, we can dramatically increase the probability that we can get more showings and an offer on the table that's acceptable because I'd much rather put you in a situation where we can bring you an offer and you say no, or I can negotiate on your behalf and pull them up to where we want them to be versus being in a situation where we're not getting any. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, so either one of those are okay. I guess my question to you is, is based on what you're looking to accomplish and why, based on the time frame you'd like to make this happen in, in light of the economic environment that we're in at the moment, which one of those strategies do you think would serve you and your family best? Well, I think it just depends on how much we would have to adjust it. Like how much are we talking about? Like, like are we talking about like a thousand dollars? Are we talking about ten thousand dollars? Like I agree with you that we have to reduce. It just comes down to like how much are we talking about, you know, because if it's a little amount, yeah, I'm open to it. You know, if it's like a big amount, I, I don't want to take a loss. I understand. And, and I don't want you to either. And again, we're here to help you. We're never here to twist your arm and talk you into doing anything. So you're the boss here, right? Whatever you decide, we'll, we'll be perfectly okay with. And what I'm aware of is that if we were only missing by a small amount, you know, like a thousand or even 10,000 bucks, as you mentioned, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. We would have offers on the table and we'd be one step closer to getting you out to Texas. Being that we're getting a few showings a week and no offers on the table, the marketplace is showing us we're missing by more than that, more like 5%. And that would take us from the 800 that we're at currently to 760. And in doing so, we'll position ourselves in alignment with other properties that have received an offer in your price point over the last 30 days. Now at the 760, Jose, you're actually gonna net 325,000 from the sale. I'm wondering, would that allow you and your family to make this move happen? It would allow us to, but it just, I wouldn't want to reduce it to that price. And the reason I wouldn't want to reduce it to that price is if I come down to 760, I know people are not going to pay 760. They're probably going to want to offer me 730. So if yeah. I just keep it at the 800, you know, like people will come in maybe like 760, 755, and I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I just don't want to go there. I understand. And I appreciate the logic, right? I, I, I certainly see where you're coming from. The idea being that if I make an adjustment, then I'll get offers less. And if I stay higher, then the offers will come in higher. And can I share with you what would concern me for you and your family if you utilize that approach? Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, that's operating under the assumption that whatever we're going to get for this property is static, meaning like it stays the same. Now, tell me this. Would you say that real estate kind of prices, are they static or are they fluid? Are they constantly changing? No, I mean, they, they, they change, but I mean, I still hear that there's like low inventory and uh, I know that rates have gone up tremendously, but I kind of hear that things... Uh, that there's pretty low inventory still, you know? Yeah, I understand. And what I'm aware of is the only reason it would make sense to wait to make an adjustment 
is that if we waited, we'd be able to get more money. Do you agree with that? That is true. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over with you some of the changes that we're seeing in the macroeconomic environment and how that's affecting real estate. So that way we can determine together as a team if that's um, probable or not. Because if it is, great, we'll do it. But if it's not, we may need to rethink the approach. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So the first thing that we're seeing that's happening is that you mentioned it. Interest rates have gone up faster in the last uh, 10 months than they have in the last 30 years. Did you know that? Um, no, I didn't. Yeah. So in January of this year, a 30-year fixed mortgage was around 3%. Do you know what it is today, Jose? I don't. It's about 7.14%. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, what that means is, check this out. Somebody who was approved for $800,000 in January, do you know what they're approved for today? No. They're approved for $650,000. Wow. Same buyer because the payment's gone up so much. So here's my question to you. Jose, what do you think that does to the pool of prospective buyers? Yeah, but aren't like people buying cash nowadays, you know? Like aren't like people like paying cash for properties, you know? Like especially in this price point, I hear like a lot of people are coming out from California and just bringing all their cash down to Florida, you know? Yeah, so what I'm aware of is we were seeing that about seven, eight, nine months ago. What we're seeing now is we're returning back to normal levels of cash purchases. So at the height of the marketplace, around 20% of all of the purchases were cash. Do you know what it is today? Don't know. 7%. So that means 93% of the population is getting financed. So of that group, that pool of prospective buyers that are getting financed, what's happening to them as the cost of money goes up? It's probably being reduced. That's right. And when, when demand shrinks, what usually happens to prices? Come down. They come down. That's exactly right. And, and just by you saying that demonstrates that you're beginning to realize why we're having the experience that we're having, right? Now, the second factor that we see happening is we have record high inflation. Have you felt that at the gas pump of the grocery store recently? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. We all have. And it's at a 41 year high Jose. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah. And in fact, we just had a high reading, which was 8.2% uh, this month. So that means that next month we're going to have another fed funds rate hike, which means that mortgage rates in by the end of the year will probably be at 8%. Were you aware of that? I did not even realize that at all. Yeah. So here's my question to you, right? Because I'm all for it. If it's probable, we'll do it. So it's possible. But the question is, is it probable? So moving forward over the next 30 to 60 days, based on the economic data that we just discussed together as a team, what seems more probable? That if we wait, we'll be able to get more money and that prices will keep going up exponentially and the economy will boom? Or does it seem more probable that, in fact, as time progresses, there will be downward pressure on pricing and economic uncertainty and volatility moving forward? Which do you think seems more realistic? Yeah, well, obviously, the version where um, uh, like it, it doesn't look good. I know that. And that's part of the reason I wanted to sell now. But he, here's the thing, Aaron. Like The thing is that like I don't get it. Like We've had like four to six showings on the property already, right? And, or eight, whatever it was. Um, like, like if, if somebody actually likes the property, why don't they just like make me an offer? Like yeah. that's the, that's kind of like the reality. Like I would imagine that, that if somebody really likes it, that they would make us an offer. I'm imagining that they don't like the property. Therefore they're not making us an offer, which means that even if I reduce it, they're still not going to like the property. Yeah. That's a fair question. And, and I appreciate you bringing it up. And, I thought about the same thing prior to re prior to having this conversation with you, because I want you to know, Jose, as uncomfortable as it is for you to hear this, it's equally as uncomfortable for me to share it with you. I just take the responsibility you provided me with exceptionally seriously, which is to protect the value and get as much as you possibly can. And because of that, I'm a thousand percent committed to giving you open and honest feedback with what I'm seeing in the marketplace so you can make decisions accordingly. And... I don't know if you know this, but in your price point between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars, do you know how many properties are on the market in your, you know, county? I don't. There's actually twenty-five. 
Do you know how many of those have reduced their price in the last 30 days? No. Half of them. Do you know how many have gone under contract in the last 30 days? How many? Seven. So what's interesting is that people are buying and selling. The challenge is, is when they have more to look at, it becomes a beauty contest and a price war. Whatever's the best possible condition, and that is positioned at the most competitive price. And what's interesting is of those seven that went under contract, do you know what they were, they were asking? Either they no. were asking or it was below? They don't. 760. Wow. So what do you think that tells us about where the buyers are seeing value? Yeah, yeah. The that we'd probably have to be somewhere around seven sixty. I didn't realize there was actually that much inventory. But like, I mean, what happens if I just make like a smaller adjustment? You know, like, like what if I just come down like from eight hundred thousand? Like, I mean, what if I come down to seven ninety? Because that's a lot of money, right? Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. And of course, we can do that, Jose. Like, you're the boss. My job is to help you. It's never to talk you into doing anything. Here would be my question to you, is that your neighbors, they've actually done us a huge favor. Do you know what it is? I don't. They've tested the market for us at certain prices and it's not working. Did you receive what I sent you where I showed you all the active listings that are on the market right now? And you're yeah, not only in your I, community. I looked at it, yeah. Yeah, and did you see the ones that were asking 790 and 787 and, and they've been on the market 60 plus days and they hadn't sold? I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so what do you think the buying public is telling them about their price and product? Yeah, they're probably too high. Yeah, that's, that's um, exactly right. And I can hear in your voice, Jose, even as you said that to me, it seems like there's like this recognition of what needs to happen. Yeah. And ultimately, you're the boss, man. So tell me this, what would happen on the outside chance if we were still sitting here 60 days from now and the home wasn't sold? What would that mean for you and your family? Yeah, we just wouldn't be able to make the move out there in the time that we want. And, uh, it would not be ideal. Like, uh, my wife is actually already living out there and, uh, I, it sucks, you know, it does, man. And I appreciate your authenticity and your willingness to share and tell me this, let's say that you knew that two months from now, instead of 760, it could be 740. What do you think you'd do today? Um, I would reduce the price to 760 fast, yeah. like right may, now. May I make a suggestion? Sure. Yeah, based on market dynamics, my sincere concern for you and your family and how much you get is that over the next two months, as interest rates continue to rise, there's going to continue to be downward pressure. And we have a choice, which is to get ahead of this thing. And based on what you described to me as far as getting closer to your family and wanting to get ahead, my suggestion would be is let's go ahead and let the marketplace know that you would consider an offer of 760. And the best way to do that is to position it there. And then... We can fight for you tooth and nail. I'd much rather put you in a situation where we can get an offer that you say no to, flat out no. Or I can negotiate and try to pull them up to where we want them to be versus being in a situation where we're not getting any at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome, brother. So do I have your permission to go ahead and put that in? Let's do it. Right? So I saw you taking, uh, drop in the chat if that was hot, if that was fire. Let's go. Drop it in the chat. Let's go. And listen, guys, this is the conversation that you are going to be having on a regular basis. Every time you take a listing, this is the conversation that you're going to need to have. And you have to prepare yourself for it. You have to be okay with politely confronting people like I was with Jose as he kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. Notice, did I lose my cool? Did I get impatient? Did I get angry? Did I get frustrated? Like, bro, like, really, bro? You can't see what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Like Jose and his team like to say, like, bro, bro. I didn't do that. I just stayed calm, stayed collected, kept asking questions, kept politely confronting him. So that way he can self-discover what needs to be done. Awesome. Right. I just opened up the chat boxes for people. So I think that they were disabled and someone was kind enough to kind of share with us. So go awesome. at it, guys. Chat Drop in the chat. Open. Let us know. Fire. Oh, man. He said, bro, I got sunburned. Let's go. <laughs> you got sunburned from all the fire. Brandon's like, fire. Yay. Awesome. Fuego. Fire. You're damn good. You're damn right. I'm damn good, team. But what I want you guys to realize, too, is like, like, this is not something that Aaron just woke up today and he's like, oh, like I'm just going to do a price reduction script. You know, this is something that he has practiced over and over again. So when I said, 
can we reduce it by X? That's not the first time Aaron has said that response. When Aaron, when I said, well, what if, uh, why doesn't somebody just make me an offer? Or what if we just wait? This is not like the first time Aaron has ever said that response. So usually what I tell people is like, like I'll say, well, look, if I'm role-playing this, I'll be like, well, why can't we reduce it by this? And usually what I hear is like, uh, 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 and then they start to wing things versus having a canned response. So here's the thing. If we know what they're going to say to us, if we know that, like how many of you guys have ever heard, hey, can we only reduce it by $5,000? instead of $40,000. How many of you guys have ever heard, well, why doesn't somebody just make us an offer? Or why does, how many of you guys have heard, why don't I just wait? You know, so if you know what they're going to say, like, shouldn't we know the response? Like, I'm expecting there to be resistance, guys. Like, you shouldn't be freaking out about the resistance. It's going to be there. For those of you that are interested, I'm going to drop in the chat uh, where you can get the scripts, right? But um, uh, you shouldn't be freaking out about the fact that they're going to resist because they will understand that the majority of people have the majority of their net worth tied up into their house. The majority of Americans have the majority of net worth tied up into their house. So because of that, there's going to be lots of resistance and pushback. So you got to just stay calm, stay clear, um, you know, and have a response to what they're going to say to you. Okay. So hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully this is useful for you guys. Hell yeah. Brilliant. Fire. Be the calm in the storm. That's right, Danny boy. Now, now the thing I, I, I do want to uh, bring up, and this was something that was big for me. Notice how like Aaron asked for the price reduction. And once you ask for the price reduction, what's going to happen next is either they're going to accept, they're going to say, okay, let's reduce the price, or they're going to start objecting to your objections. But it's almost like uh, like, like expecting a pitch if you're a baseball player. And if you're a baseball player and you know that the pitch is coming, you're going to be ready for it as opposed to not being ready for it. So as soon as they start objecting to it, you're already ready for the objections. Yes. And that's a wonderful point because what a lot of people do is they, um, they like beat around the bush. So, you know, it's time to have the adjustment. You probably haven't been calling during the honeymoon period. And then you start to like verbally vomit. You start to fill the air with words and you talk a lot, like waiting to actually ask, right? But they're not silly. They know what's coming and it's taking you too long to get there. So they start to object before you ask. And what happens is you're not really ready yet, right? So the analogy that Jose's sharing with you is what I shared with him. It's like, look, if I'm standing up to bat, so Jose used to play uh, baseball, baseball back in the day. Bro. We got to see you in those, those tight pants, bro. So um, if I'm waiting for a pitch, right, I'm ready. But if I'm standing, looking up in the stands, like I'm talking to people over here, I'm looking over here, I'm not ready for that pitch that's going to come at 100 miles an hour. But if I'm focused, I'm ready. So if you notice, it only took me like two minutes to get to where That's I actually important. ask him for the adjustment. I'm like, hey, here's what's happened, okay? So I'm gonna give you a formula, write this down. Um, st like, what's state what's uh, the intention of the call? So the intention of the call today, right? Like, what are we talking about? Then state what's happened. We've been on the market X amount of time. We've had X amount of showings. What that means is what we're doing is working. At the same time, having that number of showings and no offers, it's actually beginning to concern me. May I share with you why, right? You tell them why. So you state what happens, tell them what they need to do, right? Reduce the price. Then, so, and, and then you close and now you're quiet. Now I'm standing in the position, I'm waiting. Cause they're gonna object. Like very rarely are they gonna be like, you know what, Jose, you're right. Let's lower it 50,000. Like they're not, that's, that'll happen like 1% of the time. And then, and then after you ask, shut up. Like meaning like, like I'll be like, okay, so the marketplace is clearly showing us that we need to adjust by about 5%. That would take us from the 800 that we're currently at. That would take us down to 760. Do I have your permission to go ahead and put that in this way we can get the property sold? And then just listen at that point. Don't say anything more. Just listen to, and at that point, they're going to be like, ah, oh, well this or well that, or they're going to start objecting. But at that point, there's only a certain number of objections that you're going to hear. And like, so for example, like one of the ways that I handle, can we reduce it by X? Like, let's say that they say, well, can we reduce it to 790? 
I'll be like, well, look, Aaron, we definitely can reduce it to 790. Obviously, we can do anything that you want to do. Let me let me check. So at 790, it's actually like a 1% adjustment. If we were actually getting people coming back a second time or people talking about potentially writing an offer, the marketplace would be telling us that we're missing by a smaller amount, maybe like one, two, or maybe even 3%. Being that we're not getting people coming back a second time and being that we're not getting any people talking about writing an offer, the marketplace is showing us that we're missing by a much larger amount, which is 5%. Once again, that would take us from the 800 down to 760,000. Would I have your permission to go ahead and put that in this way we can get the property sold? And then quiet and And see what comes back. Boom. Here's another way to handle the, and and this one that I learned not too long ago, it's like, well, why don't you, uh, why, like, I don't understand why people just don't make me an offer. And I would get stumped on that one all the time because I was like, well, that's true. Why don't I just bring them an offer? So what I, what I, what I started saying, uh, like within the last year, I said, yeah, it's probably a little bit confusing, right? You have people that come by the property. You would figure that if they actually liked the home, that they would actually make you an offer. So here's the thing. Aaron, like you and I, like if we like a property, we're going to make an offer regardless of what they have it listed at. Like, so if you see a property that you like, you're going to make an offer like at whatever price you think is fair. I would do the same thing. But what I have found is that most buyers don't think like you and I, you will make an offer. I will make an offer. But because buyers don't all think the way that we do is that if the property is not priced within one or 2% of where the marketplace is showing us that we need to be at, they just won't submit an offer. Even if we tell them to submit an offer, they just won't submit an offer because they think that they're offending the seller. So we have a choice and the choice is absolutely yours. We can A, continue to keep the property at the 800,000, which obviously it's proven that it's not working, or B, we can adjust the price to 760 and that'll really put us in a better position to get the property sold. So based on what's important to you and your family, well, what do you think we should do? Mm-hmm. Yep. And that and then- one started working out really well because it's like, I'm aligning myself with them, you know? And yeah, I'm aligning myself with them as well too. Like, hey, look, we actually think a lot different than the rest of the marketplace does, you know? Yep. And another thing that you can say too, is like, you know, ultimately our experience is, is that um, the best feedback we can get from the market is offers. And if they don't see value, there's usually only a couple of reasons why I may share them with you. And they're like, yeah, well, the first reason is, is maybe I'm not doing my job. I'm like dropping the ball, not marketing the property effectively. The people are like, oh my God, Aaron, you say that to them. Yeah. Do you know why? Because they're thinking it. Hundred <laughs> percent, they are. So let's, bro, let's take off the pants and be like, "Yo, it's what it is, right?" I know you're thinking it. So let's have, let's talk about it. So they're like, "Yeah, like maybe I'm not doing my job." And here's what I can tell you. And I know it doesn't mean much because yours hasn't been one of them. We're doing the exact same things that we've done to help X amount of families this year as a team, or X amount of units, or X amount of volume. So we know that that works. That's not the issue, right? The second reason why we're getting no offers, it could be the condition. Now you tell me, do you feel like your home is not in good condition? What are they always going to say? It's an excellent condition. It's fantastic, Aaron. We have mallards in the backyard. We feed them. The sunshine comes in from the east. You know, whatever, whatever they say, because they think it's the best. Okay. And whatever they say, you're like, I agree with you. Your home's in wonderful condition. And then that leaves us with the third reason why it's not selling. And that's the price. So tell me, you know, based on the economic environment that we're in with interest rates going up very quickly, with, um, you know, uh, there being a record high inflation and the economy as a whole beginning to slow down. I mean, what do you think's really stopping us from getting an offer? Honestly. And they'd be like, well, it's probably the price. Exactly. So just by you saying that, recognize that we need to make an adjustment. The question is just simply how much. Now that's some Jedi shit right there. Okay. So when I say, yep, I agree with you. The marketplace is showing us we need to make an adjustment. The question is just how much. Now we're not even talking about like, it's not like I need agreement from you that we need to make an adjustment. It's like, yep, we're already doing it. Now we're just talking about how much. Now, if we were only missing by this amount, then we'd have this, you know, uh, if if we were only missing by a small amount, like maybe like one or 2%, we would have, you know, uh, offers on the table already. Being that 
we've had showings in the offers or very few, if any at all, the marketplace is showing us for miss a buy a little bit more than that, more like 5% or 7%. And I would also suggest or propose to you guys, what's up, Salima, that is Jedi shit, right? Um, what, what I would also propose or suggest to you is that ask for more than what you're comfortable for. Because what a lot of you guys will do because you don't like confrontation is you'll, you'll ask for a smaller amount and then you'll get even smaller than that because they're gonna wanna chip that down. And, and the way I look at that is almost like baseball again. Like um, I look at it like strike one, that's one price reduction. Strike two, that's second price reduction. Strike three, you're out. Like meaning like they, the more price reductions you ask for, they begin to lose faith in you every single time. So like meaning like it's better to ask for more than to ask for less basically. Because by the time you get to the third reduction, it's almost like, dude, like, come on. Like, what's going on? What's going on? And they, they actually lose faith in you, like Jose's saying. So um, I, I'll give you an example. So Heath, if he's on this call, Heath, uh, he's on the team and uh, we're helping him, you know, kickstart his career. Uh, he's an awesome member of the team. I think he's taken 14 listings in five months. He's got a good teacher. So um, he's taking a lot of listings. And what's happening is, is some of them aren't selling. Probably 80% of them are selling. So then boy needs to come in and help him out with getting these adjustments and he's like let's go so he's got a couple sellers where we're just missing the mark like by a lot in some instances so he has one in particular where you know it's uh not selling she's calling him every day hey what's with the flyers and we got to do open houses and all that stuff drop in the chat if you got people starting to say that to you mm -hmm. that's right the force is strong with your boy you can feel it so um He's like, hey, man, I need your help. I'm like, hey, may I please hand me the microphone, please? So we hop on a call last night and, uh, you know, she's 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 being aggressive. And I was like, listen, um, I want to be clear, like our intention is to help you. It's never to talk you into doing anything. So whatever you decide, we're going to support you 100 percent. And um, Heath was kind enough to share with me um, that you know, what your goals and objectives are and what you're looking to accomplish. And we're here to help you make that happen. Now, prior to giving you some guidance as far as, you know, making that happen, what I'd like to do is just revisit what, like what your goals and objectives are and ask you a few questions to make sure that I'm crystal clear on that. Would that be okay? She's like, yep. I'm like, okay. So he shared with me that the reason why you want to sell the property is XYZ. Is that correct? Yep. Is it an option for you to not sell the home? She was like, no. Is it an option for you to rent the home? I don't want to do that. Okay, so it sounds like what you've decided what makes the most sense is to actually get it sold, okay? And um, so then with that being the case, we have a few options that are at our disposal. I'd like to review them so that way you can decide what you feel is best, whatever you decide, I'll support you. So I went through the same thing that I just did, and then I asked her for percentage-wise, like a pretty large adjustment. Something that I know Heath on the other end was like, because <gasps> I just asked for a lot. I just like, nope. And she was quiet. When I said it, I said the number, it was like 35,000. I'm like, that's what it is. And then like Jose said, I was quiet. And she's like, well, all the common objections. Then it was like, I want more flyers. I want open houses. And I push back on that as well. Cause I'm like, listen, I appreciate the fact that, you know, um, you're imagining flyers are like, you know, gonna help you to get your home sold. And trust me, if we felt that it would actually be of assistance, we would do it. I guess I'm curious, um, did you, like used to back in the day have a drawer where like when you wanted to eat out, you had like all the menus in the drawer. Did you used to have one like me? She was like, yeah. I'm like, do you still have one? She's like, no. I'm like, what do you do? She's like, I go online. I'm like, exactly. So what's true is, is that flyers were a mechanism before there was like technology. And now people go online and that's why we focus our time and energy and efforts there. What's also true is with regards to open houses is that, you know, our professional experience is that they only sell the home that you're sitting in 1% of the time, right? The Association of Realtors did a study, 20,000 homes, and it only sold the home that you're sitting in 1% of the time. Can I share with you the nitty gritty of my business? And they're like, what? Home, like home open houses on homes, they're actually a mechanism for agents to find buyers to sell them other homes. Did you know that? And they're like, mm, I guess so. She's like, well, I did open houses. I'm like, yeah, you did as a for sale by owner. I'm curious, did you sell it? She was like, no. I'm like, yeah, so it's really, I'd much rather focus our time and energy and effort on activities that are actually gonna get it sold. 
So she tried to give conditions with regards to the adjustment, but I pushed back on both of them. And then she said to me at the end of the call, well, I'm going to have to get back to you on the price. I'm like, okay, well, what are you going to think about? Like, nope, we're not getting off this call until we complete this conversation. And she was like, well, you know, this and that. And I'm like, look, she tried to come back with another number. And what I said to her is like, what I'm aware of is my intention is not to negotiate with you. It's not. My intention instead is as a consultant, give you the information that I'm seeing in the marketplace. So that way you can decide what you feel is best. And I know that sometimes it's uncomfortable. At the same time, I feel like it's my duty and responsibility. I mean, we just had a property in your area where... We had an offer three months ago at um, 650. The deal fell apart and we're getting offers now at 600. That's not negativity, it's an accurate assessment of reality. So if your intention is to get this sold, my sincere concern for you is that in 60 to 90 days, it'll be less. And that's not negative, it's just what's true. So with that being the case, do I, we have your permission to go ahead and put that in? And then I was quiet. And then she was like, okay. And then we move forward, right? But again, guys, I can't stress enough. You have to get comfortable. You have to do the honeymoon period. You have to manage the expectation up front. You have to remind them that this is a conversation we're going to have to keep having. You have to politely confront people. Like confront their logic. So you notice as Jose was talking, I was confronting his logic where he's like, yeah, well, can't we just stay up here? And like, then I'm going to get offers that are higher. I said, well, I appreciate that. And you know, what I'm also aware of is that's operating under the assumption that prices are static, meaning the amount that you're going to get for this is fixed. Now, would you say that home prices stay the same and they're fixed no matter what? Or do you, would you say that they're fluid and they change? You're like, yeah, they're fluid and they change. Okay. So with that being the case, can I go over some of the things that are causing the changes to happen? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then we go over that. So I'm challenging his thinking, but I'm doing it in a polite way. The other thing I wanted to add is like most of us, at least this was the case for me, whenever I would role play certain things with people, I would always role play the same things. So I would jump on a call with Aaron and be like, I want to role play expires. I would jump on a call with Lenny. I'd be like, I want to role play expires. And the reality is that I role played what I was comfortable with. And I also role played what I was good at because I wanted the other person on the other line to be like, man, this guy's really good. But then when my business actually started to grow is when I started role-playing on the things that I was not good at. And I started role-playing things like price reductions. I started role-playing things like, um, I just started role-playing different things that I was not normally working on, knowing that I was going to suck, but just kind of letting go of my ego and humbling myself. And then that's when my business actually started to grow, when I started focusing on the things that I was not good at, like little sections of little things, like the closing part of the presentation. I've already got another agent, price reductions, objections at the at the price reduction. So I would encourage all of you guys to, to, to do that or something similar as well, too. So what we're going to do now is now we're going to shift over and we're going to do a uh, formal presentation of EXP and the model. Now, before people who don't want to stay for the EXP presentation hop off, imagine if you could have access to this information for free a lot more a month, meaning like right now I see people on the call who come on once a month. We obviously share enough value with them, but imagine if you could have access to this type of information daily, even weekly. Like, could you imagine how much more your business would grow? So what I want to encourage you guys is we actually want to give you guys access to this type of information more frequently on a daily, even weekly basis. That way you guys can grow your business. So if you're interested in EX, in partnering with us at EXP, uh, we're going to do a formal EXP presentation and we're going to basically share with you not only some of the benefits of EXP, but we're also going to share with you guys some of the benefits of partnering up with Aaron and I specifically. For the people that uh, obviously don't want to do that, we thank you guys so much for uh, uh, taking the time. We would encourage you to stick around because once you see it, it's very hard to unsee it, guys. So if you guys are open to it, we'd love to get into that with you guys. And uh, you'll have a lot more access to this a lot more frequently. Let's go. All right. So let me pull it up. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And uh, and this is going to begin. All right, guys. So let's let's do this. Can everybody see the screen? Yep. All right. All right. So uh, today we're going to be sharing with you uh, EXP, the model, and why it's the fastest growing company uh, or real estate company 
uh, faster and it's grown faster than any other company. Uh, I believe that we went from 80, 20,000 agents to 80,000 agents in a matter of a couple of years. So we're going to kind of share with you guys why that is happening and why so many people are partnering up with eXp specifically. Warning, whatever you've heard of eXp or whatever thing, I promise you it has not been explained to you the right way because if it has been explained to you the right way, you would already be at eXp. So whatever you've heard, just be open-minded and uh, and ignore anything that you've heard because we're going to explain it to you the right way. So let's make a little bit of an assessment for you guys. So we're going to ask you guys a series of questions and we just want to hear your honest opinion um, about uh, where you're currently at and see if we could even be of service to you guys. So let's get real about the uh, current business and the platform that you're running in. So what we're going to do is you're going to rate uh, these questions on a scale of one to 10. And then you're basically going to let us know like, okay, like the platform that your business is running in, whether it's EXP, whether it's Keller Williams, whether it's uh, Century 21 or Coldwell Banker, uh, how would you rate the platform that your business runs is running on uh, today? Uh, how would you rate your current real estate business in terms of time, money, stress, and just overall on a scale of one to 10? All right. Are the top agents in your market actively uh, acting like competitors or collaborators? How would you rate that on a scale of one to 10? Meaning the best agents in your market or your company, are they kind of sharing everything with you? Or are they kind of keeping it and hoarding it to themselves and just saying, no, you're my competition. I'm going to hold on to this. This is my competitive advantage. I'm not going to teach you anything. Rate it on a scale of one to 10. Uh, does your brokerage give you stock just for selling homes? And this is not one through 10. This is either a 10 or a one, meaning either you're getting it or you're not. All right. Uh, is your brokerage partnering up with you and showing you how to build residual income on a scale of one to 10? Meaning does your brokerage currently have mechanisms for you to um, earn other income sources aside from just selling real estate, scale of one to 10? Does your company currently offer you a retirement plan? scale of one to 10, or is the only mechanism for you uh, to basically sell properties. And the moment you stop selling properties is the moment you stop getting paid. All right. How excited are you about the future of your real estate brokerage on a scale of one to 10? Meaning, do you feel like it's on the cutting edge, like the metaverse, or do you feel like it's a little bit antiquated? All right. And uh, that is it. So uh, we asked you seven questions to rate them on a scale of one to 10. Um, if you scored anywhere around 60, that's an A. If you scored anywhere from 35 to 40, that is an F or a D. So think about it. If you went to school and you got an F or a D, is that acceptable in our uh, society? You want to go over Novella? Yeah, so, and the harsh reality of this kind of industry is that the, it's failed to really create a clear path for financial freedom, right? Pr traditional brokers, they keep real estate agents and team leaders on a transaction treadmill. Drop in the chat if you feel like you're on a transaction treadmill, right? We're just constantly just looking for the next deal, looking for the next deal, looking for the next deal. And productivity coaching and traditional training methods are not getting it done. I think we would all agree that the level of instruction that you just got far supersedes anything that you're receiving from where you're at, right? Because you're getting it from people who've actually produced at very high levels. And most agents and team leaders won't be able to retire gracefully. I mean, that's just the facts. Awesome. Yeah, and you're in the right place if you're either an agent or a team leader and you wanna like go to another level as far as growth, if you wanna hang out with business builders, rather than struggling agents. So proximity is very much so power. To Jose's point, if you had the opportunity to spend an hour a week with me, Jose, one of our senior partners, Lars, on a regular basis, all multimillionaires within the real estate space, like what, what would that do to the quality of your practice, to your skill set, to your mindset, to your business? You want to grow a business in a way that systematically increases your net worth and time off. Most agents just run their business like a cash grab, 
meaning like they're trying to do deals, they rip out all the cash and they go spend it. But that doesn't like realize if you play that out over time, there's no end to that, right? You basically have to sell real estate till you know, you're not able to. And you want to learn how to make a shift from the transaction treadmill approach of real estate to a much more highly lucrative lifestyle business. Agreed. Yeah, and you're also in the right place if you're not where you want to be financially and you don't have a clear path for financial freedom. What I found, you know, I have the good fortune, I coach agents throughout the country, nine of which, you know, gross over a million dollars a year. And this kind of dirty little secret that nobody talks about is that what's the rule and not the exception is that most agents make a lot of money, but don't have any. They don't keep any. They don't have any residual. They just have big lifestyles. And that's unfortunate. Right. I remember being on a call and no disrespect to anybody that's in this category, but I remember being on a call and I'm like, listen, guys, if I'm in my like older age, 70s and I'm talking about contacts and listings like I screwed up. Right. Um, and most people work evenings and weekends, letting those around you down. And that's just true. Traditional success in this business is working 70, 80 hours a week. And when you do that, something you say yes to is something else you have to say no to. You have to say no to health. You say no to family. You say no to extracurricular activities. Like you say no to all those things. And you're stressed more than anyone you know, and you can't seem to get it together. And you're constantly missing out on important events uh, for the urgent matters of real estate. I don't know how many times, I'm sure it's true for you, Jose. I'm like having to duck out of, you know, like events with family because I got to take a phone call. I'm having to duck out of vacations and my wife's looking at me like, really, bro? And I'm like, babe, I got to take this call. Like, la, 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 right? So you're in the right place if that is your experience. And we, we see really big challenges in the real estate industry, right? Together as a team, for sure. And this is a little bit about us. So, Jose, I'll let you talk about yourself. Cool. Uh, married five years, two sons, over 650 properties in my career. Um, our team sells 100 plus real estate. Uh, I think we've done that for like four or five years in a row now. 65% uh, sellers, 35% buyers. And then what I have done is I actually uh, invested all of my money back into real estate. So I currently own 57 rentals. 37 of them are my wife and me, and then 20 of them are in a partnership with uh, two other uh, individuals, totals up to about $14 million worth of real estate. Love that. Not too shabby. My name's Aaron Novello, for those who don't know me. Um, I've been here for 17 years, done over 2,000 transactions in my career. I sold 100 homes a year for the last 11, 12 years in a row. I've done 200 deals a year twice which is me and two assistants and like a couple of buyer's agents, speaker, coach, again, 100 paid coaching clients throughout the country, investor, multiple seven figure net worth. Awesome. And traditional like agent challenges is when you stop making money, I'm, you stop making money when you stop selling. There's no exit strategy. When you take a vacation, everything stops. When you're, you know, got an event that you got to be at, everything stops. And that's a challenge. And the hours and the stress that are required in order to be successful, they're not worth the sacrifice. I agree. And uh, the picture right there is, I don't know if you guys have ever felt like this, but like you felt like you're on a like transaction treadmill, meaning like the moment you stop selling real estate is the moment you stop receiving an income. And I noticed this uh, in my career. So I started investing in real estate, but I thought to myself, there's got to be an easier way. Think about this, guys. If you ever get sick, if you ever get in a car accident, if a loved one ever gets sick, could you still earn income based on the current structure without selling any real estate? So a lot of times we don't think about this, but this is stuff that happens. You know, your wife could get sick, my kids could get sick, it requires that I take a six month, a year off. Like, do you have a plan for unexpected things that could happen? You know, at that point. Uh, before I joined EXP, I wasn't that clear on the plan aside from all the real estate that I own. But now I know that there's an easier way to, to build residual income. And this is why we're so excited to share with you guys this opportunity. And then there's challenges with the team model is that you spend time helping agents grow and then they eventually leave. And that's just true. You're ultimately training your competition and you have to give away margin to keep agents happy, meaning you have to keep changing splits, right? Yeah. And EXP actually provides a solution for that, which will basically uh, guide you guys on. That's right. And then there's challenges with the brokerage model, 
And the challenge there is that there's constant churn because the grass is always greener. 40% of agents change companies every year. I'm going to say that to you again, not because you didn't hear me, but because it's a pretty huge number. 40% of all agents change companies every year. So it means you have to constantly be recruiting agents. Low to no profit made with uh, in the brokerage, and they make it up for title and mortgage. I know I actually used to own part of a KW office uh, or be an investor in one. So I know that there's not that much profit in the actual brokerage, and it's really in title and mortgage. And there's no way to add real value and truly impact agents' lives. Well, I'll go back to this one. What I kind of noticed, and I had agents that would leave my team from time to time. And when they would leave my team, it was like like a lot of times they would switch companies. So now if somebody from my team wants to leave my team, it's like, great, well, let's just partner up at eXp. Let me still help you grow your business. Not only that, but it also allows you to partner with A players as well too. It allows you to partner up with people that aren't going to want to be on your team, but that are okay with partnering partnering up with you at eXp. So this opportunity has allowed me to partner up with people like Jason Walters, Jesse Gomez, Ricardo Salazar, like Aaron Novello, Kelly Johnson, like some of the best agents around the country. So it actually helps make the team model stronger. So like if you're looking to eventually grow a team, it actually allows you to partner up with different agents. Uh, some of them A players, some of them uh, beginners, but it allows you to make your team actually stronger and it allows you to have just different opportunities for people as well too. So it just gives you an extra uh, way of partnering or partnering up with people. Yes. So for the, like, and just to make that super clear is that, okay, if you have a really strong value proposition, meaning you offer like leads, you have great coaching, you have a CRM that's dialed in, like people would perhaps partner with you and there's splits involved, right? At the same time, if somebody's like already producing at high levels, like they're probably not going to want to do that, but they will partner with you because of the value stack and, and what's being provided. So you can really offer now people two separate options, which again, just, you know, increases our options as agents and increases our different ways of being compensated because there are multiple ways here at EXP. Yeah, agreed. All right. So here's where we get into the, the money, as your boy would say. Good. So th this is kind of something that I experienced. So I, I, when I joined EXP, I met with agents and I asked every, uh, a lot of the agents, like, do you have a residual goal as to how much residual you would like to make on a month to month, either now or as you get closer to retirement? And what I found out is that agents would say something like, oh, I want $5,000 or I want 20,000. Some people would even say I want $100,000. And then what I would ask them is I said, well, look, if you want $20,000 a month in residual, how much would you have to invest at a 5% return in order to get that? The problem that I experienced is this, as soon as I would say that, I would just get a blank stare. Like, what do you mean? Like, how much do I have to invest? The It's easier to achieve a goal if you can reverse engineer it. I mean, like if you actually know how much you have to invest, you will basically know what you have to do to earn that $20,000 in residual a month. So the reality is that in order to receive $20,000 a month, you have to invest about 4.8 million, 4.8 million in order to get to $20,000 a month, which means that you have to net over, like, if you just assume 30% expenses, you're looking at like, probably like five, six million. And if you assumed another 30% in tax bracket, you're looking at probably like another 8 million total. So it means you'd have to make about $8 million in order to save about $4.8 million. That's $4.8 million saved. And that's assuming that you're investing all of the $4.8 million at a 5% return. That's how much it would take. So I've actually done something similar where I bought a lot of real estate, but it seems really sexy on the outskirts, like, oh man, you own $14 million worth of real estate. But what I soon realized is that it came with a lot of headaches. It came with a lot of like money, a lot of sacrifices. Like literally I've had to live very conservatively relative to the amount of income that I've made to invest the amount of money that I've invested. And the what I asked myself is there's gotta be an easier way. There's gotta be an easier way to get this amount of residual without sacrificing everything that I'm currently sacrificing. And what I found, I found EXP and there actually is an easier way to build residual income by partnering up with different agents. 
That's exactly right. It's a it's it's massive leverage. And it's been said that the most expensive thing you can own is a closed mind. And that was 1000% my experience. Again, because I had an ownership um, uh, position in a brokerage firm, you know, I was like a hard no. And it's interesting because, you know, I've worked with Jose and, um, you know, in a coaching capacity for like a long time since he's probably 26, 27 years old. And he was ready to make a change in a company. And at the time I was with a different company. So I'm like, hey, check these people out. And he's like, yeah, and he did. And then he ended up going to EXP. And for a whole year, he said, dude, he, he's like, I tried to help just one person see what I saw for a whole year. And it was me, right? So he would, you know, persistently, if you know Jose, he's a pretty persistent guy. He's charming. He would close little things. He's like, hey, bro, when you come to EXP, bro, you know? And um, I just never took the time to actually look at it. And I think that's what's really true for most people. It's like a hard no. They think they know, but they haven't actually studied it. So after about 10 months of this, I, um, I made a decision to be like, okay, well, let's, let's look at this. Like, what, it, what actually is this? Because I never took the time to study. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it, right? So I studied it for two months because I'm aware I have a little bit of influence. And I knew that if I was going to do something, other people might do it. So I need to make sure that it wasn't just good for me. It was good for other people. So I studied it for two months. I triangulated ideas of believable people. Some of the people that are my mentors that make, you know, worth 30, 40 million dollars individuals and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Can you poke a hole in what I'm seeing? Am I, can you see something that I'm not? Right. And they couldn't. So once I saw that, um, I just, you know, was ready to make that change and did it swiftly and quickly. But I'd never taken the time to look at it. And what was interesting is I. I asked some people that were in the organization that I had been in that were higher up, and I asked them a simple question. I'm like, hey, what's one good thing about the model? Can you tell me one good thing? And they couldn't, which what that let me know is, is they never even looked at it. They never studied it because their mind was completely shut. And the most expensive thing that you can own is a closed mind. So have you actually studied the model? Yeah, and the right. fastest so, way to grow your real estate business and create massive level leverage income stream is to partner with the elite builders nation at EXP Realty. And you can do it without ever having to pay for coaching and training and technology ever again. And that is fantastic. Again, super high level of instruction from the top 001% of agents in the nation. So we're going to explain to you EXP in nine minutes. And we're going to explain to you why this is the most disruptive platform in history of the real estate industry and why it's the fastest growing company by double of any other company that has ever existed in real estate. Yeah. So we're living through like this massive disruptive change and um, we just may or may not like recognize it. I think we all recognize it to some degree, but it's really quite massive. Like, you know, I had to explain to my son who's 12, what Blockbuster was. Because he, like his world is just Netflix and streaming content. And I don't know if you guys know this, but Netflix tried to sell itself to Blockbuster twice. And they tried to sell themselves for $50 million. That's it. And the CEO of Netflix, we'll see in another slide, was like, nope, they're not even on our radar screen. You guys are a little baby bug that we're just flick away. We don't have to worry about you. I actually used to work at Circuit City when I was, you know, a teenager, 16, 17, 18. And that got put out of business by Amazon selling electronics online. And the same thing is happening with traditional brokerage firms and EXP. You have to keep in mind, though, what's going on underneath? What's the one thing that's causing all of this massive disruption? And it's the Internet. Right. And again, we're living through this. We just sometimes we not may, we may not recognize it, but that's precisely what's happening within the real estate industry, and that's why they've gone from twenty thousand to eighty thousand, eighty five thousand actually in just two years. Yeah, and here's what he said: uh, the CEO of Net, uh, of Blockbuster, Net, uh, Redbox, nor Netflix are even on our radar screen in terms of competition. <laughs> Boy, was he wrong! I'm curious: was his mind closed? A hundred percent. And here's the little red boxes, which are still around. And, you know, you don't have Blockbuster anymore. We're also living through a time where I remember when I wanted to go on a trip with my family or with my, let's say my, my mom and dad when I was younger, and we wanted to stay somewhere. 
The only place you could stay was a hotel or at a family's house, a family member's house. Like, that's it. Or a friend's house. That's it. Is that the case now? No. You have all these other options. And what's crazy is this slide shows you that Airbnb is a 10-year-old company and it has a larger value valuation as a company than Hilton. Right? And again, what's underneath the internet? That's what's causing the disruption. And here's a history of models. So I love this one because it explains very clearly what's happening. And this is a traditional firm, a traditional brokerage firm, any of the Realogy, Century 21, Remax, like all of those firms, they all fit within this category, which is that there's a king or a queen at the top. And then there's a regional owner. They pay a bunch of money to own a region. And then there is someone who buys a franchise, like the regional owners sell franchises to people. Those franchise owners own the office of the market center. And then there's the peasants. Who do you think the peasants are, guys? It's us. us. Agents. And we do all the selling and all the money flows back where? To the up. top. That's right. Now, if you notice, what is the shape of this? A pyramid. So, you know, we hear that a lot of times. Oh, you use a pyramid. Okay, well, all businesses are pyramids, right? And at the same time, what's interesting is that the, in this feudalism model, the peasants do all the work and they never own anything. They never have any ownership, right? And the majority of them die broke. And you don't get rich by trading time for money. You get rich by owning equity, period, end of story. So this is the kind of original model. And then another company came around who's red, right? And uh, they said, okay, I think we can do this better. And it wasn't out of benevolence that they were thought we can do this better. What happened was, is the founder of that company noticed like one day half of his agents left. So he sat them all down and said, hey, what do we got to do? He's like, well, we want you to be transparent. We want to be able to see the books and two, we want to share in the profit. Fine. And that revolutionized the game because now the peasants, there's a chance that they can participate in some of the profit that flows back up. Right. And the way that model works is there's splits. It goes into the market center or the office. They pay all of their expenses. If there's any money left over, 50% goes to the agents and 50% goes to the agents that recruited agents to the office. Okay. That's superior. And that's what caused that to become one of the largest real estate companies. And here's what EXP does. EXP. So if you notice, there's international region owner, staff, and then the agents. Well, this model makes you the owner because it cuts out all those people in the middle. And then what you're getting is you're getting lead generation, technology, training, health insurance, stock awards, revenue sharing, and collaboration like you've never seen. How many of the top agents in your marketplace, like Jose and myself, will hop on a call and show you how to get a price reduction? How many people would do that? You just never see it. We did a live event in California. Jose invited competitors into a room to show him his listing presentation. He's like, hey, here's how I'm whooping you guys' ass all the time. <laughs> how many people would do that? Like they don't. It just promotes collaboration at such a super high level. Yeah. And then the reality is that like um, w the way that I saw it is like as a top agent, like top agents actually get ownership in companies. Top, top agents like Aaron and I get offers like of title ownership, own, owning a piece of the market center, owning a piece of escrow, owning a piece in a loan company. But what I realized is that a lot of the agents didn't have access to this, this same model. So what I, what I liked about EXP is that because everybody has access to the same stock ownerships, because everybody has access that whenever they uh, bring agents on that they get a piece of the revenue, it creates a dynamic where now everybody wins and it levels the playing field for everybody. So when I was debating which company I should go work for, I didn't want just the company that benefited me because I got offered a lot of money for different companies. I wanted a company that benefited everybody because my philosophy is that if we can create a win-win for everybody, then that's the only way to grow. And that's the only way that it's sustainable over a long period of time. And that's really what I saw in EXP that it literally cut out the region. It cut out the owner, it cut out the staffing, and it basically made the agent, the owner, meaning the moment you join EXP and the moment you sell your first house, you get stock in the company. The moment you 
bring on another agent and they sell a house, you get stock in the company. There's five different ways to earn stock, which stock makes you an owner. So my question to all of you guys is how much, how many houses would you guys have to sell at your current brokerage to become an owner? And the reality is for most companies, it's not possible, you know? And that's what I didn't like. I wanted a piece of the pie and I wanted the people that we partnered up with to have a piece of the pie as well too. You're, so you're not, not going to get buying. rich renting out your time. You must own equity. Meaning how many homes would you have to sell at your current company to become an owner in the company? Is it even possible? All right. So this is EXP. That's right. So remember how we shared that the underlying disruptor is the internet? So EXP, the brokerage is in the cloud, which is the internet. And as such, it eliminates all these monthly expenses. I know because I used to be involved in one and have an ownership interest. Offices cost like $50,000 a month to run and none of you guys ever go there. They have to bribe you to come in with fucking sandwiches and like chips and you know, donuts. donuts. Yet Coffee. you pay and yet you pay for it, right? What, what I find super interesting is between 2020 and 2021, nobody went to the office. And here's my question, did it matter? Nope, didn't matter at all. Everything was fine. We still processed deals. We met on Zoom. We did all that stuff, right? So what we were all doing this model, we just didn't call it that, but we still had the same fixed world expenses. And as a marketplace, by the way, begins to change and shift and revenue goes down, which model do you think would come out superior? One that has 900 offices or 1,000 offices or 2,000 offices that cost forty to $50,000 a month, $60,000 a month to run, or one where the brokerage is in the cloud? Exactly. Right? Exactly. So the brokerage in the cloud eliminates monthly expenses and then it can compensate us like owners. So uh, this is an example of ways to partner up with people. So like, let's say that you invite a friend to the company and that friend uh, caps out. You uh, as an agent can make up to $2,800 per agent that you invite to the company. Uh, let's say that you invited uh, six agents to the company. That is a total of 16,800. The cool thing about the company as well, too, is that, that let's say that each one of those people invite one person as well, too, is on the second line, you actually get paid as well, too. And that comes out to $3,200. So by inviting six people to the company and each one of those people inviting one person, that could be a total income of $36,000 per year which amounts to about 1.4 million invested or you know 720,000 invested and you'd have to make about 1.4 million. So my question to you guys if you guys wanted to get 36,000 in a year meaning $3,000 a month is it easier for you guys to save up or make 1.4 million and invest $720,000 of it? Or is it easier for you guys to invite six of your friends over to the company and have each one of your friends invite uh, a friend? Now, the other benefit is that this is only two levels, guys. There are seven levels to this thing, and it doesn't change anything that you're already doing, meaning like all of you guys are selling real estate. All of you guys have friends in the real estate business. All of you guys invite friends to work with your company. All you'd have to do is to invite them to this company to work. 100%. And I can already hear some people because I'm aware, like when we start to have this conversation, like, oh, I don't want to recruit. Like, I just want to do deals. Fine. If you'll notice, we're committed to helping you do units and volume. We just spent an hour teaching you how to move inventory by getting price adjustments. Like you don't just, just doing deals, right, is perfectly or fine. We're all about production. Without really trying that hard, if you just invite people to webinars like this, we will help you to grow. And myself and Jose, we are 1,000% committed to helping you do that. If you notice and you watch, watch our activities, not what we say, but what we do. We did a live event in California. We had 100 plus people in the room. We did a webinar last time. We had 170 people in the room. This time we had about 80 people in the room. I just did a live event here locally. We had 100 people in the room. I'm coming back out to California to do another event. All you have to do is to invite people. Just get them here and then we'll help you to grow. You don't even have to you know, really try Do anything. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's different forms of leverage, right? There's labor, there's capital, 
and then there's really content. And labor is where you have people work with you or for you. Capital is where you have money working with, you know, for you. And it's superior to the leverage of labor because capital works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't get sick, doesn't get tired. But then there's, you know, um, content or code, uh, right? Because that works anywhere on planet Earth. And that's the power of this brokerage firm is because it's based on the um, internet. Um, you know, if it, you get the leverage of labor without the capital of labor and you get the leverage of labor without the management of labor. So what I would dawned on me is instead of owning like a piece of this fixated brokerage firm that has, you know, 50 to $60,000 a month in expenses, I was aware that I could build a digital office that will be bigger than that office without the leverage of labor, uh, without the capital required for labor and without the management required of labor. And that gives you time freedom and it gives you location freedom. Drop in the chat if you're interested in time freedom and location freedom, because I sure am. I sure am as well too. Yeah, and Jose, I think you could take this because this is one of the ways you explained it to me when we were having conversations. So I, I was at an event at a commercial real estate event and the guy made an analogy that stood out to me. And he said, Jose, look, if you and I are racing and you're in a Honda Accord and I'm in a Ferrari, he said, who's going to win in the race? And I said, well, of course, the Ferrari. Even if I'm a better driver, the odds are probable that the Ferrari is going to win just because it's a better vehicle. Then he said, well, what if you're in the Ferrari and I'm in the Honda Accord? He's like, well, I would win because I'm in the Ferrari. <clears throat> And then what he said to me was like, look, that's the difference between residential real estate and commercial real estate because the numbers are larger. Uh, because I'm in commercial real estate, it's a better vehicle to increase your net worth tremendously. And I looked at him and I was like, "I the way that it was explained was good. So then when I was having the conversation with Aaron, I said, look, man, you're already at a good company. I mean, you're already in a nice car. It's red as well too, you know, and the Ferrari is red as well too. The difference is that just by switching vehicles, it'll allow you to grow your residual income a lot faster. And the reason is that for Aaron, the income that he would make would be based on profit, which companies have a lot of expenses. And sometimes profit margins can be like 10, 15, 8%, 7%, 20%. At EXP, it's actually paid on the revenue that the company has made because it cut out a lot of the unnecessary things. So basically, the numbers are a lot bigger. Like at Aaron's previous company, like one of the top people that makes the most profit share, I think was like a million bucks or a million five maybe a year. Over here, there is people making 14, 15 million bucks a year. I have friends making 50, $60,000 a month. To me, two, $3,000 a month, it didn't catch my attention. When people started throwing out numbers and I started seeing like 50 grand a month, I was like, man, I've worked 11 years in real estate. I have invested $14 million worth of real estate to one day have 14 to 15,000 or 40 to $50,000 a month in positive cash flow. And you're telling me that I can do this in a matter of two to three years. Like it just become an, became a no brainer for me. Yeah. And the way you described it to me too, is you were like, Hey bro, like if I was in the uh, like Ferrari Honda. and you were in the Honda, who would win? I'm like, well, you would. And you're like, even if you're a better driver in the Honda, like a more skilled driver, I was like, yeah, you would. And you're like, why? And I was like, well, I guess the car. And you're like, yeah, it's the vehicle. And what I realized I was in a Honda and I don't know about you guys. I don't strike. Uh, like you ask yourself a question. Do, do I strike you to be a Honda type of guy? <laughs> nah, bro. I'm a Ferrari type of guy. Right. So um, I just realized like, oh, like the vehicle matters, right? So, and and to Jose's point, you can compress time and you'll see in some slides how we're compressing time. So some sometimes all of you guys already have the right skills, like meaning like you could be working for another company, but because you're not getting access to the right information, um, you're stuck or your business is not growing. It's the same exact thing. So like sometimes you already have like all of the potential to be that Ferrari or be in that vehicle, but because you're not getting the right information, you're kind of stuck. So um, what I would say is if you're in the right vehicle, sometimes it's not like even uh, how skilled you are. Like I could be not the worst driver in the world, but as long as I can go straight and press the gas, I can beat Aaron if he's in a Honda, you know, as long as it's a straight ahead and there's not any curves or anything like that, you know? So that would be my challenge to you guys is just to ask yourself, like, like 
which vehicle are you in? Are you in the Honda or are you in the Ferrari? You know? And if you want to ride in a Ferrari, get with your boys. So um, the reason why, one of the reasons why we're so, I do, but I just got into a Ferrari. Yeah, you did. Now, come on, I'll say you didn't get a Ferrari, bro. You're better than that. Um, and the innovation curve, this is why we're super excited about this, right? At least why I am, is when something's new, right? Um, there's this curve. And the innovators, they see something before anybody else does. That's like Glenn Sandberg, who's the founder of um, uh, EXP. And everybody thinks they're crazy. Like, that'll never work, right? Uh, and that's like 2.5% of all the growth. Then there's the early adopters. Those people have a higher tolerance for risk. And that's like about 13.5%. Then there's the early majority. And the early majority, they have a lower tolerance for risk and they need more people to do it so they feel safe. Then there's the late majority. Those people have FOMO. They feel like they're missing out. Then there's the laggards. Those people still have flip phones, right? So I personally believe that this opportunity is right now just entering into the early majority where enough people have done it, where it feels safe. And the thing that's super exciting about this, that's where 68% of all the growth takes place. 68% of all the growth is taking place at this particular time. And we went from 20,000 uh, agents in 2020 to now 85,000 agents in 2022. I think we did this slide last month, so it's still growing. Not only that, but the goal for the company, and it's a very realistic goal, is a million agents, bro. A million agents, which would make it the largest company in the world for real estate by like almost 10 times. Mm -hmm. And it's doable with the model, especially at the rate of speed that it's going in, which means that it's not too late for you guys. It's not too late to join the company and there's plenty of opportunity that's still there. So our question is, are you really going to sit on the sidelines while EXP continues to disrupt the real estate industry? So how is this really different? So this platform is the change that every other industry has already realized, meaning like other industries have already gone through this change. One of the only industries that hasn't been disrupted is real estate. It's been disrupted at different times, but now this is one of the major disruptions that's going on. Aligning our interests allows us to collaborate at a high level without any additional costs. So because Aaron and I like are partners, it allows us to collaborate at a higher level. Like now I see Aaron before this, I had, I didn't really see Aaron like maybe once in my lifetime. Now we're probably seeing each other four to five times a year minimum, which means that the way that the company is structured, it allows top agents and other people in my market to collaborate. Not only that, but like I've been able to collaborate with people like Jason Walters. I've been able to collaborate with people like Jesse Gomez, Ricardo Salazar, Sean San Jose, Eric Gladish, and just openly share things with them. And guess what? They're openly sharing things with me. So we're basically helping each other out. There's no other company with a clear path to real, real, real wealth and exiting production while making uh, real estate fun again. And so, what, is your, what does your future look like? Right? There's me, there's your boy, Hosey, there's one of our senior partners, Lars, and, and that's you. Silhouette could be you. <laughs> so, what so, do you get? Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say exactly the same thing. What do you get? Yeah, so it's like, well, what do you get, right? So anybody can provide you access to the brokerage firm. The question is, is what are they offering above and beyond in terms of a value proposition? So I think the way most people approach this, it's just not accurate. It's not right, right? So they're like, hey, judge, come join me, join me. But they're not actually interested in adding value to the other person. They're only interested in what's good for them. So we've been very intentional and purposeful about the value stack that we've created. So as I mentioned, I have a coaching company, 100 paid coaching clients. And 75% of all the coaching that I provide becomes free to our partners, right? So um, we have a group call once a week. It's for an hour via Zoom where I will teach people things like what we just did, price reductions, mindset skills, all things real estate. Agents pay $250 a month to be on that call. That's free to our partners. We have role play groups. Guarantees a role play partner five days a week. All you have to do is show up. We handle all the scheduling. Uh, we have two of them, one in the morning for setting appointments, one in the afternoon for listing appointments uh, and practicing the listing presentation at 1130 after prospecting. And agents pay about $800 a year to be in those groups. Those are free. I have online classes that are in 23 uh, countries and eight languages. Those are free. And then um, I have two mastermind groups that we run. 
Uh, one is called the Accelerator Group. Agents have to make $250 a year to $500 in GCI to be in that group. They pay $400 a month to be there. That's free if you fit the criteria. And then the Freedom Builders Mastermind, of which Jose um, is a part of, agents have to make $750 a year or more to be in that group. And um, it's $400 a month. We do live events. And for our partners, if they fit the criteria, of course, then that group is free to them. Cool. So on my end, uh, you guys actually get access to something called Morales Group University. Morales Group University is basically all of the live trainings that I've done with my team uh, in all in one place. So I have trained uh, different agents to get the different levels of production and it's all recorded. So if you wanted to see listing presentation role plays, expired role plays, probate role plays for rent by owner role plays, obituaries role plays for rent by owner those are all located in one place and available to you 24 seven for you to view. There's even some live recordings from actual price reductions, actual listing presentations as well too. You also get access to a once a week mastermind with me on Fridays at 12, where I kind of just share anything that you have questions about. And I teach you guys things as to how I'm running my current business and some of the challenges and some of the successes that I've had with my business. On top of that, I am a super, super systems guy. So um, I basically share with you systems and processes as to how we handle the amount of production that we handle and how we were able to process over 100 uh, transactions, 130 last year. So we kind of share with you the exact systems and processes. That way you can use that. So what a lot of people do whenever they want to do something is they try to recreate the wheel. Um, the best thing that you actually can do is instead of trying to recreate it, just learn from people that are already doing what you want to do. So that's what we give you guys access to. Yeah. On top of that, one of our senior, or you want to go? No, go ahead. So on top of that, uh, I was very purposeful as to who I partnered with. So when Aaron and I partnered together, we obviously saw a great collaboration, different strengths that we each have. Uh, one of our senior partners, his name is Lars Hedenborg, and he actually owns a company called Real Estate B School. B stands for business. He actually coaches a lot of the top teams across the country as to how to grow their real estate team in a way that it provides you freedom, less stress, and still the amount of money that you want to make. He's coached some of the best teams in the country, teams that are doing 500, 1,000 deals plus. So we purposely partnered with him uh, to be able to grow our, uh, uh, to in case somebody wants to grow their team, that way we can provide an additional layer. So you have Aaron as a real estate sales uh, guru, not guru, but real estate sales mentor, mindset mentor. You have me with social media systems, procedures, and then you have Lars for team building as well too. And then we've got a lot of uh, different other products as well too with some of our partners that they're offering as well. So our question is, if you had to pay for all of this individually for proximity to Aaron, myself, and Lars, how much do you think that that would actually cost you a month? Like how much do you think having this type of access would cost you a month? I'd say probably like 20, 10, 20 grand. A lot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's our question. Do you currently have a retirement plan? So if I'm selling real estate when I'm 80, I don't want to be selling real estate because I need to. I want to be selling real estate because I like to. Unfortunately, that's not the case with a lot of people in our industry that they're still selling real estate in their 80s, not because they like to, but because they need to, meaning they never set up the time to set up a retirement plan. So the time to start is now. The time to start is not when you're 99, but I mean, but you can start actually now and start planning ahead. Yeah. So, and this comes from the cash flow quadrant. There's E, S, B, and I, right? Employees, self-employed, and then business owner and investor. 90, probably 5, 97% of the population earns income on the right, excuse me, the left side, E or self-employed, like employee or self-employed, like as an agent. And what we want to get to is we want to get to the other side, which is business owner and investor. So what this platform provides you with is you get equity, you get ownership just for doing deals, right? You get stock and that makes you an owner immediately. And then, you know, um, through additional streams of income, you can have more income to become an investor and you'll get more leverage in your life. And that's really what we're after. 
And this is a breakdown. So most people don't do the numbers and the math, right? So if you think to yourself like, hey, how much do I want to make per month in residual income? What's my freedom number? If it's 5,000 a month, it's 1.2 million invested at 5%, which means you got to earn 2.4. If it's 10,000 a month, it's you know 2.4, which means you got to earn 4.8 and so on and so forth, right? Most people are lazy in their thinking. They don't really think this through and get really, really clear on what it's going to take to actually get to the numbers. This was the biggest challenge when I was meeting with agents, Aaron, that most people did not know how much they actually had to save to make the amount of money that they wanted to make residual. So the reality is if you don't reverse engineer it, you're never going to get there, you know, because it's, and for most people to make a hundred thousand dollars in a month, meaning like save 24 million, it's not realistic for most people under the real estate traditional uh, stock or buying real estate model. But with EXP, I've got friends making 50, 100,000 a month mm -hmm. without having to save up $24 million. So let's do the math, guys. So what is your I'm done number? Okay. How much would you have to say? How much do you have saved so far? Like meaning like, so if your I'm done number, if we go back is $100,000 a month, and you know you have, or let's say thirty thousand a month, and you know you have to save up seven point two million. How much have you saved so far? You know, how much are you currently saving per year, and how many years will it take to save the difference? So, meaning, if you've been selling for re real estate for ten years, and you only have like fifty thousand dollars in the bank account, thirty thousand dollars in the bank account, you know, like that is. Uh, that formula is a good indication of what you could probably expect for the next 10, 20 years. They say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So if you continue doing the same thing over and over, then you could likely expect what you've done in the last 10 years to project over the next 10 years. So based on where you are today, how confident are you in terms of where you are going? Meaning based on where you are today, based on your uh, current, current situation, how confident are you as to where you're going to go? So this is a snapshot. You want to go over this one, Aaron? Yeah, uh, this one's a little old because the last time we did this was in August and now we're at, I'm at like 63. But like this shows you like the money's real, right? We like being like real transparent and shows you what's true. So when I did this, it was uh, like a couple thousand dollars a month in rep share. I'm looking at my current screen. It was 3,500 last month. It's so far 3,200 this month and Damn. counting. Yeah, bro. I'm trying to catch up with you, brother. So um you know, like I'm aware that uh, the intention in doing this is not to brag or boast, but just to show you like this is really tangible. Like it's it's legit. Yeah, this is for me and this is old as well, too. So I had a month that I made close to six grand and then forty five hundred dollars a month as well, too. And then this is old. So it was at eighty seven. Now it's at one hundred and seven uh, as well, too. So just to kind of show you guys that it is real. I've been with the company for approximately like a year and a half. Aaron has been with the company for what, three months at five the months. most? Five months, five months at the most. So think about it. Look, Aaron in five months uh, is earning $3,500. That is the equivalent of investing 1.2 million almost, uh, or three thirty five hundred. 3,500. Yeah, it's almost $5,000 a month. So it's the equivalent of investing a million dollars at 5% return. In order for Aaron to invest a million dollars, he would have to save uh, a year's worth of income in order to save that million dollars in order to get that $3,500. Now he's been able to compress that timeline in five months. So instead of having to wait in a year, saving all that money, now he's able to compress that amount of time and do it in a much shorter period of time. Same thing goes for me, where instead of having to invest a million or $2 million, I've been able to compress that. Now here's where it gets redonkulous, guys. This is our senior partner, Lars. And uh, it shows like $85,000 in a month. In a month, guys. How many of you guys would like to have $85,000 a month coming in residual? Yeah. It's life-changing, man. That's the equivalent of $20 million invested, which means you would have to have $40 million earned over or more, which is very rare. There's very few people on planet Earth that would actually be able to do that. So this is what I tell people like... Um, 
like uh like this is like literally life changing you know all right so you have a choice you can either attract 10 to 15 agents in the next two to three years meaning ask 10 to 15 agents to partner with you or you can save up 4.4.8 to 7.2 million dollars in the next 20 to 30 years what would and you we, rather do and which seems more probable or likely yeah it's possible predictable and you are not alone we can help you with this we can and we're committed to helping you go further go faster elite builders <laughs> <laughs> that's right cool. so more money more freedom and more of an impact so again it would be a privilege and a pleasure to partner with you if you somebody who has interest in doing so um, reach out to the person who invited you to this um, if somebody didn't invite you to this and you want to have a conversation with me and jose like let us know as well and uh, we're here to serve, man. We're 1,000% committed to adding as much value as we possibly can, helping our partners grow, adding value, helping them do lots of transactions. And uh, we're here to help. Yeah, absolutely, guys. So if you if somebody invited you to this, just thank them for the invitation and uh, feel free to reach out to them. And obviously, they can schedule a call if, for whatever reason, uh, uh, Aaron or I invited you, uh, feel free to reach out to us specifically. We're here to help. We're here to help you guys grow your business and we're here to help make an impact. Any questions that you guys may have? Questions, 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 guys. Any concerns or hallucinations for you, Mr. Novello? No, I'm good, brother. No hallucinations today, man. Just ready to get my grub on. I'm a little hungry after bringing that thunder and fire. Awesome, guys. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I think Andres asked, uh, Andres, what's Mission the... Split. Yeah, it's it's 80-20 split with a $16,000 cap. So it's basically like Keller Williams has like a cap of like 23000 or 20000 plus royalty fees. It's 16000 flat, no royalty fees. So for most people, either you're not capping or you have like a twenty three to 26000 in some cases even 30000 cap. EXP has the lowest, uh, one of the lowest fees in the industry with, with a cap of 16,000. Not only that, what with most companies under this, once you pay the cap, that cap, there's no way to recoup that money. It's almost like throwing away money. Uh, with EXP, if you reach certain production method uh, mechanisms, you can actually get that cap back in stock. Um, so there's a way to earn that stock back or that entire cap, the entire $16,000 if you reach uh, uh, after you cap, if you do a minimum of 20 sales after that, then uh, you can get the entire thing back in stock. And as long as you meet a, cu a couple of other uh, cultural um, and participation uh, events, like attending an EXP uh, seminar as well too. But you can earn the entire thing back in stock, man. Yep. All 16,000. So yeah, most companies it, thrown away, EXP, you could actually earn it back. That's right. And, and, you know, the people like me, I'll, I'll earn that back. Jose will earn that back. And if we need, if you need help with the kind of getting you up to the production volume, that will light earn it back. Well, that, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Cool, man. So should we sign you up on this or what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Giving him the, giving him the Jose special. He's like, let's go. <laughs> he said, lol, call me. That's right. Boom. I love that. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Welcome you to the Elite Builder Nation. Cool, guys. Anything else? I think Aaron's going to go get some grub, and I'm going to go get some grub, too. So we appreciate you guys. Uh, if you guys uh, uh, were invited by somebody, once again, reach out to the person who invited you. If, for whatever reason, Aaron or I invited you, uh, feel free to reach out to us via Instagram or uh, on Aaron's website, and we're happy to... Uh, help you guys and uh, we look forward to potentially partnering up with you guys yep and my website is aaronnovello.com just aaronnovello.com and it'll pop up so appreciate you guys go be great have an amazing rest of the day on purpose we'll talk to you All soon right. later guys bye